Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here, this fantastic venue. And I will start with a radiographic slide of a clinical case. When you see this image, what do you think? What are the feelings you're getting? Hemmerl is out of his mind. Maybe that's not completely wrong. Some people will think it's a short implant. Then I will ask you, if this is a short implant, then what is a normal implant? You may also think, well, crown-to-implant ratio is unfavorable. It's a shorter implant and it's a normal crown. Again, I would like to ask you, what is the documentation of what is a normal or a favorable crown-to-implant ratio? Then maybe you also say, well, there's more bone available, so you should use a longer implant because there is more bone. So I will ask you, there are situations. Here, for instance, you could easily place an implant of 10 millimeters. But what if you have a clinical situation where you have 30 millimeters of bone? Somewhere anterior mandible, situations like this occur clinically. Will you then place a 30 millimeter implant? I imagine not. They're very hard to buy. So the critical element is not how much bone is available. So our thinking evolves around something different. Furthermore, well, the implant may be as long as the teeth. This is what it should be. But the teeth are anchored differently in the jawbone than the implants are. So teeth, I think, are not a good reference. What do you think about this image? Now, everybody's kind of amused. I am too. So here we agree this is too much. But how will we know how much is too much, how much is enough, and when it is not enough? This will be the topic of the presentation. Let's go to clinical situation. Two colleagues, do we place a short implant or do we make a cantilever? And the other one immediately will think, ooh, ooh, overloading. So traditionally, we've been placing implants as many as possible. Today, I think we go for placing as few as required. But the question is, how do we know what is really required? Or how do we know how much osteointegration we need? One possibility would be to look at histology, beautiful histology of osteointegration, and look at attempts to break osteointegration. So we go to animal experiments. Here there are three animal experiments where intraoldal premature enormous contacts were made. Different groups have studied this, but they did not find a loss of osteointegration in any of their studies. There are only very few animal experiments that were able to break a once established osteointegration by intraorally occurring forces. So the conclusion from these studies is, generally speaking, animal experiments do not support the concept of overload by masticatory or parafunctional forces. We have to note, however, very clearly, the literature shows that the anchorage of rough surface implants is significantly higher than that of machined implants. So we're only speaking about rough surface implants for the remainder of this presentation. Let's go on. Now, this didn't really help to tell us how much osteointegration is required. And I think there is a green zone and there's a red zone. In the green zone, we know we have enough osteointegration to support the loading forces. In the red zone, we may have just one trabeculum left attached to an implant. And by definition, it's an osteointegrated implant. But then the first time I bite together, this trabeculum will break. So there is a red zone. But what we're interested in is the gray zone in between. And I think that this question most likely can only be answered with well-designed clinical studies. Scientific evidence derived from well-designed, close to real-life studies. Let me quote something which has been published not too long ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, some very high-ranked journal. And the investigators, in a very large trial, like they can do in the United States, they found that birthdays are good for your health. And the evidence was that 
Studies have shown that people who have more birthdays, they live the longest. It's this type of evidence we're now looking for. Clinical situations representing biomechanical challenges. You agree a cantilever would be a biomechanical challenge. Maybe an unfavorable crown to implant ratio would do the same. And of course, the short implant is a biomechanical challenge. Let's now look at these different elements and have a look at the literature. John Andrea Held from our department in the practice of Jörg Schmid has done a study, 27 fixed dental prosthesis with cantilevers and compared them to 27 without. Five years of observation time, and he did not find a difference in survival or marginal bone levels. So no increased bone loss with the cantilevers. If we go to a systematic review published by Alietta, the study group of Klaus Lang from Bern, the focus question, what is the survival rate of short-span FDPs with cantilevers? What is the frequency of biological and technical complications? And just to come to the results, they had 99% survival of the implants at five years. Survival of the reconstructions was a little bit lower. So high implant survival rate, slightly lower for the reconstruction, but no loss of os integration. So if you look at the cantilever literature, and I cannot show everything, but the conclusion is that there's no loss of os integration. If we move on to unfavorable crown to implant ratios, what does the literature show? Well, we're talking about something which is given in a tooth and which we influence by the length of the implant and the distance from the crest to the opposing jaw. And the question we're asking is, will an increased crown to implant ratio lead to increased marginal bone loss? And that would be an indication of overload. Blanes, Berna, Blanes and Belz did an excellent study in their material. They had 83 patients with almost 200 implants, single crowns and fixed dental prosthesis, and they measured the crown to implant ratio. They made three groups. You can see them in these radiographic images. The first group, where we would all say this is very favorable. Then an intermediate group, and what they would call a difficult group. And they compared the, uh, these three groups over time, and they found that the marginal bone loss was the highest in the group with a favorable relationship. You see that the group B and group C, they have the same, but the group A has a less favorable one. So the conclusion was that more than two of crown to implant ratio showed even less margin bone loss than the control groups, both control groups. Crown to implant ratio had no influence on the survival rate of the implants. We looked at our own material in our department. Dave Schneider did it with Lukas Witt. We had 70 patients with 100 implants. Again, follow up on more than five years. And Dave could conclude, crown to implant ratio did not influence the clinical performance of implants supporting single crown restorations in the posterior segments of the jaws. Again, if we summarize the literature on crown to implant ratios, we do not find the loss of osteointegration. Short implants, the next topic. Kotsovilis, they did a systematic review. The focus question was, is there a significant difference in survival between short, and they said less than eight or less than 10, and conventional more than 10 millimeter rough surface dental implants. They made two groups in their table of survival rates, one group with partially dentulous and one with fully dentulous patients. Less than eight millimeters, let's look at the partially dentulous, 97% of survival. 10 millimeters, again, 97, and more than 10, 98. There were lower levels of survival in the edentulous patients, but again, both groups had no significant differences. So Kotsavillis and co-worker concluded no statistical or clinically relevant difference with respect to survival rates between long and short implants. We have a study in progress in our department together with operative dentistry. We're also placing implants in their perio section. The aim is to test whether or not dental implants with rough surfaces inserted in the posterior maxilla and mandible supporting all single unit restorations 
are predictable in their outcome as the 10 millimeter implants. Now, normally implants are placed according to the amount of bone which is available. In this study, with 100 patients, we did it differently. We took sites where a 10 millimeter implant could be placed, and we randomized for the control sites with 10 millimeters and the test sites with 6 millimeters to really get a feeling how much osteointegration for a single crown replacement is needed. Are we still on the safe side with a 6 millimeter implant over extended periods of time? So far, at two years, we have almost 100 implants under investigation and almost 100 reconstructions. And you see that three have been lost. We have no significant differences at two years between the two groups. Neither for survival rates nor for marginal bone level measurements. Of course, we need longer term information about this. If you go to the systematic reviews that address these questions, we can list five taken from the literature. And I just have a summary of the results here. Most of them say it's identically unless we go below five millimeters or we use surfaces other than rough surfaced implants. So the overall conclusion, implants six or more millimeters with rough surfaces exhibit similar survival rates. At this time, that is limited to shorter observation periods. So for short implants, again, we don't see loss of OS integration as documented in the literature. If we summarize these elements, cantilevers, no loss of OS integration, unfavorable crown to implant ratios, short implants, none of them show loss of OS integration, and these are our challenging clinical situation. So my question to you then is, what are the options that we compete with? that short implants do. And have a list, these are the cantilevers in clinical practice, sinus floor elevations, maybe osteotome technique, and vertical ridge augmentations. Let's look at their documented survival rates, just quoting some systematic reviews. 94% for cantilevers over five years. 98, three-year survival rates for lateral window technique and sinus lift. Osteotome technique, 93, a little lower, but we have to be careful in the studies there were many machined implants. Furthermore, vertical ridge augmentation is difficult to say. There are different techniques. I have listed them here. They have different types of survival rates. Common to all of them is the fact that they have high rates of clinical complications, morbidities, as Professor Boozer talked about, and they're technically very demanding. So they're not for everyday practice, but short implants are. If we make a comparison of these treatment options, and I've listed them above, and let's look at the additional morbidity over simple placement of an implant. Osteotome, of course, is a little bit higher. Lateral window, significantly higher, and very high type of additional morbidity with vertical augmentations. We look at the treatment time. Maybe we want to leave the short implants a little bit longer to also integrate before we load them. But we have six months of healing with augmentations, be it sinus or vertical augmentation. And we have a little bit prolonged when we do the osteotome technique. Then additional costs. A short implant is a cost-effective type of therapy. These are Swiss francs, so it ranges from three to 600, up to 1,800 francs additional, just because of the additional procedures. The difficulty of the intervention, I think osteotome and short implants are maybe similar, but the other two are clearly more difficult types of clinical interventions. And the last one is the survival rate we already looked at. Say they're all at about similar levels over three and five year observation periods. So if we summarize all this, I'm sure you agree with me that the trophy goes to short implants. So my question, having all this information now collected and put together, why don't we place short implants all the time? 
And it's, for me, a real question to think about. Why don't we do that? Why do we keep placing the longest implants possible? We should use the implant which is necessary, the one which is required. And let's list the clinical advantages of short implants. We need less diagnostic procedures. If I'm staying away from critical anatomical structures, I don't need to do CTs and whatnot. I have a lower risk of damage. Dr. Boozer talked about damaging the nerve in the posterior area of the mandible. If I take shorter implants, I stay away four millimeters. I don't have this risk. Same with sinuses, nerves, and other elements. I can avoid large augmentation procedures, which have their morbidity and tricky. I need less diagnostic and surgical skills, which is also an advantage. We've heard from Mr. Gadola that it's more in general practice that implants are placed. So these people, or we are not specialists focusing on a single element of dentistry. So this would help us to have implants placed more broadly in practice. Lower morbidity we've extensively talked about. We have less complications. I like the icon here. We have lower costs. We can offer the treatment to more patients. Imagine lower morbidity, less complications, lower costs. This is a practice builder. You will reach more patients, have a better reputation. We can decrease the treatment time as we have seen. And if you put all this together, then we have eight really significant advantages to use short implants. So again, why don't we place few and short implants all the time? And if I ask you in your mind, what is a short implant for you? How short is a short implant? Some people will say 10. Some will say 8. I go, I don't even start at 8. I would say, do you think 7? Do you think 6? Is it 5? 4? 3? 2? I can imagine a two millimeter implant. Well designed, full arch, mandibular reconstruction. Now I'm running out of space, unfortunately. Let me show the results of Ten Bruchenkarte, 1997. They had seven year data, and they had pretty decent survival rates with six millimeter implants. So Strauman fabricated these implants 20, 25 years ago. And for us, these are standard implants. And now, as you've already heard, there is the four millimeter implant. And it's not just two millimeters shorter. It can mean that it can be a revolution in patient care. If this works, we can treat a lot more patients with implants that we could not in the past, in new situations. And here's a study, and I like to give credit to Christos Lotte for providing the data for me to be able to show them today. It's a five-year prospective multi-center study to investigate survival rates and marginal bone maintenance of four millimeter implants. Material and methods, 28 patients, 86 four millimeter implants, edentulous area severely resort, posterior mandible, placement of three to four implants, and now they're joined together. Crowns, but they are fused together. Here you see at implant placement, same case at the type of reconstruction, one and five years postoperatively. And it's really looking good at five years with four millimeter long implants. At five years, the results show 24 patients available with 71 implants, survival rate 92%. Margin bone level changes from placement to reconstruction, almost half a millimeter, and then stability over time. It only increased by a tenth of a millimeter over five years. So they could conclude, this study showed that four millimeter long implants can successfully be used for fixed reconstructions in a severely resort posterior mandible with a survival rate of 92% over five years. Now you will tell me, well, I have seen studies, they have 99% survival rate at five years, and this is only 92. So what are you trying to tell me? But I can tell you for sure, in these studies that show 99% of survival, there's not a single patient with a situation like this. 
They're all excluded from these studies. And here the options are something removable, maybe augmentation procedure, or refer the patient somewhere else. Now we have options to treat these patients ourselves. We are also looking at loading, trying to explore the zone, the gray zone. And we have six millimeter implants with and without cantilevers. The study is still in progress, but just trying to show you what we're doing at the university. This is not a clinical concept, but at the university to explore the borderlines and then to develop new concepts for you. Control site two, six millimeter implants. I'm sure this gives the shivers to some of you already. And then the test, the six millimeter implant with the cantilever. Here are some more radiographs, just to give you an idea where the research goes to then have a new basis to give information. Conclusions. Nature has an adaptive capacity frequently far greater than we expect. Biomechanically challenging situations, and we looked at them, they're not associated with significantly more implant loss than comfortable situations. The use of short and few implants helps to reduce costs, treatment time, patient morbidity. And I think very importantly, new ways of thinking may open up new meaningful possibilities. Let's not be framed in the same type of thinking forever. The clinical concept. Before I place an implant, I always ask myself, can I place a short implant, still achieving the same benefit for the patient, and obtaining the following advantages? And we've listed them before. Whoops. But please, don't do too many of them. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'd like to thank the team in Zurich for the support and the enthusiasm in doing this type of research. Thank you very much.